For our last topic of integration, we're going to look at improper integrals. And to set this up, we need to go back to the basics of integration. When we defined an integral as the area underneath the curve or the antiderivative, like the picture that's shown here, there were a couple of implicit assumptions we made. And we may or may not have seen these written down in this form. But it turns out that for an integral to be set up like this, the definite integral to be defined to be the area under the curve, we made a couple of assumptions. First of all, we assumed that this interval from A to B is a finite interval. And that seems like a pretty reasonable assumption when we're looking for an area under a curve. We define a starting and ending point such that we have a finite interval from A to B. We also assume that this function is continuous. If it's not continuous, if there are breaks in the curve, then evaluating the antiderivative poses a problem because it turns out for a function to have a derivative, it needs to be continuous and in reverse taking an antiderivative. Also, we've assumed continuity. We have assumed that we're dealing with continuous functions. But it turns out there are some cases here and there where we want to deal with functions or intervals that don't fit these assumptions. There are times where we want to take integrals over infinite intervals and there are times when we want to integrate discontinuous functions. So what happens if we break these assumptions? Now the first one you might think that if we make the interval infinite the area will always be infinity. And one of the most surprising things that we're going to find is that that's not necessarily true. It is true sometimes, but not all the time. So we'll see examples where we can integrate over an infinite interval and still wind up with a finite value for the area. And you may want to think about how that can work before we start doing examples. So we're going to break each of these assumptions one at a time, and we'll see what happens and how we can deal with the integrals when these assumptions do not hold. In both cases, it turns out we're going to use limits to evaluate these integrals. So we'll need to review a little bit of limits from back in Calc 1, but the limits we'll do here are relatively simple when you get down to it. So let's break these assumptions one at a time. The first assumption is that we're dealing with a finite interval. So let's assume we're not dealing with a finite interval. And here's an example of such a problem where we want to integrate the function 1 over x squared from 1 to infinity. So in other words, we start here at x equals 1, and we want to find the area underneath this curve extending out to infinity. Now again, you may think that this area will automatically be infinite, but it turns out in one of the most surprising results we've seen to this point that because this function is decreasing rapidly enough, because it's vanishing to zero, it turns out that it happens to be vanishing to zero quickly enough that this area starts to approach a finite value. And you'll see that as we go through here, and you'll see how we evaluate this area. To do this, we can't use infinity as the upper limit of integration because infinity is not a value that we can plug into this function. Infinity is simply a notation that tells us that we're going to extend indefinitely to the right. So instead, what we'll do is we'll start with a sort of movable upper fence. And we'll just call this t. So this value t is a variable. And if we let t equal 2, for instance, we could evaluate this integral from 1 to 2 relatively easily, and we would get an answer for that. Then, if we let t equal 3, we could again evaluate the integral relatively easily and get a different answer, which would be larger. And if we let t go to 4, and then 5, and then 6, and then 100, and then 1,000, we would start to see that those values level off and approach some limit. In other words, as you let t increase, the area from 1 to t doesn't increase without bound. It increases and approaches 
some limiting value. Which again brings up that idea that we're going to use a limit in this problem. So the way we do this is again we think about this sort of movable upper fence T and imagine moving T to the right and think about what would happen as we integrated from 1 to 2, from 1 to 3, from 1 to 4, from 1 to 100, from 1 to 1000, from 1 to a million and so on. But rather than doing all of these integrals separately, we're going to integrate once and use the variable t and observe what happens as t goes to infinity. That's the entire principle. And the way we would write this down is we would replace the upper limit of infinity with this variable t and then take a limit as t goes to infinity. So in practice, when you're evaluating an improper integral with an infinite limit like this, we can simply replace that infinity with a variable like t and take the limit as t approaches infinity. If the limits of integration were negative infinity and zero, for instance, we would change the negative infinity for a t and again have the limit as t approaches negative infinity and so on. So once we do this, we're going to integrate as normal. So we'll take the antiderivative of 1 over x squared. We'll plug in the limits of integration, leaving t as a variable. And once we're done with that, we'll evaluate the limit as t approaches infinity. And it will be a relatively simple limit, but again, it may take a little bit of review from Calc 1 to remember how these limits work. So let's carry along this limit as t approaches infinity. And then when we integrate 1 over x squared, we get negative 1 over x, because 1 over x squared can be rewritten as x to the negative 2, and then we can use the power rule on that. Now when we plug in the limits of integration, we get the limit as t approaches infinity of negative 1 over t minus negative 1 over 1, or in other words, plus 1. And now we simply need to evaluate this limit as t approaches infinity. If you haven't seen this in a while and you need a refresher, just think about what happens for larger and larger values of t as this denominator increases, the fraction 1 over t will get smaller and smaller because we're dividing 1 into more and more pieces so the fractions get smaller and smaller. This means that as t goes to infinity, 1 over t approaches 0, which means the whole limit negative 1 over t plus 1 approaches 0 plus 1, or simply 1. And again, this is one of the most surprising results we've seen so far, that you can integrate over an infinite interval, but it turns out the answer is not only finite, but it's relatively small. It's simply 1. If we let t equal 2 and 3 and 4 and so on, those answers will be approaching 1 as t gets larger and larger. And that's what this limit tells us. So once we do a few examples, it might look like we're just playing with symbols, where we're replacing infinity with a t and taking a limit as t approaches infinity. But it's important that you carry these steps out and that you write it carefully and precisely because there's a fundamental idea here which is that we're illustrating what happens as you integrate from one up to a larger and larger upper limit and then think about what the limit of that will be what the end result will be as that t trends to the right indefinitely so this integral uses a limit along the way and at the end, the answer comes out to, surprisingly, a finite value of just 1. There's a similar example. Suppose we do the integral from 1 to infinity of 1 over x instead. The graph looks very similar. 1 over x and 1 over x squared look very similar, at least in this upper right-hand quadrant. So again, we're going from one up to some variable upper limit t and we're going to allow t to increase up to infinity. So in practice we write the limit 
as t approaches infinity of the integral from 1 to t of 1 over x dx. Now integrating 1 over x is different than 1 over x squared. This does not use the power rule, but instead we remember that the integral of 1 over x is the natural log function. So now we can plug in the limits of integration and we'll have the limit as t approaches infinity of the natural log of t minus the natural log of 1. Now the natural log of 1 is simply 0, but to see what happens to natural log of t as t approaches infinity, we need to know what the graph of the natural log function looks like. And so I'll remind you in case you've forgotten, the graph of the natural log function looks like this, more or less. And as t goes to infinity, as we move out to the right, this keeps increasing without bound. It doesn't approach an asymptote or anything. So the limit as t approaches infinity of the natural log of t is, in fact, infinity. So you have something infinite minus zero, so this turns out to be infinite. Now, this may not surprise you as much as the last one. In fact, taking an integral over an infinite interval seems like it should always be infinite. And so this one behaves more like we would expect. It's the 1 over x squared function that's surprising to us because we can take an integral over an infinite range and get a finite answer. Because that function is decreasing fast enough, as you take the area further and further out, the amount that gets added as you extend further to the right is only slowly adding, and it turns out that it doesn't add fast enough to make the area go infinite. This is one of the most tricky parts of this course to understand intuitively and to grasp in a way that is satisfying. But this is a a point that's important because when we talk about infinite series at the end of the course, we're going to see a result that looks very much like this, where we'll have something like 1 over x that goes infinite, and something like 1 over x squared that goes finite. And so there's this tipping point between these two functions that's very interesting and very curious. For now, though, we'll just notice these different answers, and I'll mention some terminology here. This example, we would say that this integral diverges or is divergent because it goes infinite. So if the answer comes out infinite, that answer diverges. On the other hand, here we got a finite answer, so we would say this one converges or is a convergent improper integral. And when we talk about infinite series at the end of the course, that question of convergent and divergent, or converging and diverging, is going to be the one that we spend the most time on, looking for whether series go infinite and diverge, or whether they settle down to something finite and converge. So this is a little bit of a preview of what's coming later at the end of the course, but for now, it's kind of interesting on its own to see these infinite integrals that can potentially give us finite answers.